Okay, kids, we're going to try this again. We're going to do section two, and um, section two in chapter 15 <clears throat> deals with the home front, and um, there's a lot going on, obviously. We talked about, um, you know, the fact from 1929 until, you know, December 7th of 1941, economically speaking, things were pretty rough, and even after December 7th, 1941, the New Deal helped. Um, but what's really going to ultimately drag us out of the Great Depression is going to be um, mobilizing for war. And if you notice there, I kind of I backtracked there, but um, I had a picture of old uh, Rosie the Riveter um, that we talked about the other day when we did our propaganda. And I don't know how to keep it from going on to the next slide. I'm still learning how to use uh, the iMac. So um, in Section 2, um, everything we'll talk about is domestic. It's it, basically everything that happens um, in the United States uh, over the course of the war. Um, and a big, big part of the first part of the section is that um, women um, become a major part of the wartime production effort. And this is not something that's completely new. Women became involved um, in mobilizing for war during World War I, um, but there's a couple of uh, things that are quite different. You know, in the very first sentence there under A is it says, women begin working in heavy industry in large numbers, and many of them were married. And this is a big change. This is a huge departure from um, World War I and, and domestic affairs as far as women. Um, these are both examples of long-held traditions that were broken during the war. And, and I said, you know, on, on the slide, it says, think Rosie the Riveter. Um First and foremost, we'd never really seen women doing the kinds of jobs that they're going to be doing in industry. Um, and at the same time, um, a, a lot of them, I can't remember the, the percentage, it's like 60% or something like that, or, of 35-year-old women or something like that, 55, 65% of the 35, 35 and older women that were married. Um, many of them are going to have children and this was obviously an obstacle. It's something that we don't even really give a second thought to today. Um, but uh, as a result of so many women joining the workforce, many of them having been married and having children, the federal government spent millions of dollars building daycare centers. Um, but the reality of it was most, uh, most of these daycare centers didn't see a lot of kids. Um, a lot of children are ultimately going to stay with um neighbors or trusted relatives. Um, also, um, aside from women, African Americans also um, are going to initially have a difficult time finding work in war industry. Um, and when they did, um, it was segregated. Um, and one of the people that we've talked about in class, hopefully, um, I, I, you're, this is a name that you're starting to know and starting to remember. He's one of my favorite early civil rights leaders is A. Philip Randolph, who is a labor leader that um, was very shrewd. I think if he were around today, he would make quite um, a politician. He's a great speaker. Um, he understood, uh, he really understood how to get things done. But um, Randolph is going to issue a list of demands um, to FDR. And among them, um, the one that's really going to stick as far as the things that he wanted was to basically rid the war industry of discrimination. And Randolph at the time um, told FDR that, you know, if these demands weren't met, they were going to protest and have a big protest march on Washington, D.C. And, uh, you know, this is when we really see, um, on some level, the true colors of FDR. Um, FDR is really kind of what I would consider to be somewhat cool on civil rights issues. His wife, um, Eleanor, was much more open to the idea of um, basically leveling things out. She was very sympathetic to the civil rights movement. And um, I think both of these things play a role. Obviously, he did not want um, the bad publicity. He also thought that it would be quite dangerous if for a protest to actually occur, and it would feed um, the fuel of the enemy to have a protest during a time of war. 
And I think Eleanor also played a role. And ultimately, the result was the Executive Order 8802. Um, Executive Order 8802. And we, we, we talk about this in class, but, you know, and I said, you know, it desegregates the war industry. Um, and what it really does um, is um, make, and it, it creates a commission for one thing. The, the hiring practices had to be fair. They couldn't incorporate race into um, deciding whether or not to hire someone. Um, and... Um, as a result of this, the war industry is going to be desegregated. But this to me, and we talk about this in class, is a really, it's a big step. It's a big launching point for a kind of the birth of the modern civil rights era. Um, and I've got on the slide there that um, the result was Executive Order 8802. Interest in organizations that promoted equal rights for African Americans began to soar. And I put on there, including the creation of Congress of Racial, Racial Equality, and we'll talk about them again when we get into the 1950s and 1960s. Another group that really sees its membership go up um, is the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the, the NAACP, and we don't really talk about them too much yet, but I do want you to know that they were a group that um, really decided to fight racism uh, in the courts. Um, when we really start talking about civil rights, we will start with the NAACP um, and their, their uh, case that they will take to the Supreme Court and Brown versus Board of Education. <clears throat> and there's A. Phil Randolph. I'd forgotten I'd put in a photo of him on there. Um, another big shift or a big thing that happens um, domestically is that because of the creation of all kinds of new industry with regard to mobilizing for the war, wartime migration had large numbers of people moving in a variety of directions. Um, it, the South and Southwest becomes um, a growing economic and political force, and that's a trend that continues today. And I, I wouldn't say that universally. It, it really kind of depends on where you are um, in the South. If you go into... Um, the tri-state area of Virginia, North Carolina, and Tennessee, that's still a pretty impoverished area. But if you go down into places like Atlanta, um, the, the kind of industry that they have today is directly a result of the kind of industry that went to Atlanta in uh, World War II. Native Americans also left reservations to work in wartime industry. And the thing that's notable there is that after the war, many of them don't return. There's... Um, I think the, the 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 vision of opportunity that they see with regard to the kind of work that they could do, um, they they just don't ever come back. The biggest thing, um, and I think that if you were going to see anything on the EOI, it would probably be a question revolving around the Brichero program. So to help with the loss of workers in rural areas, the United States partnered with Mexico to begin the Prochero program, which brought laborers from their country to ours um, to work the farms. Um, and this this is seasonal work. It's migratory work. Um, and I think I, pr I probably, I don't know, when I started thinking about it, the way I worded it in the lecture in class, I thought, well, we talked a lot about Iowa and Nebraska, and that is part of it. But um, the Southwest is um, largely where a, a lot of them are going to be initially. Anytime we've had migration in this country, if you think post-Civil War, um, if you think um, even during the Great Depression, anytime you have massive numbers of people moving into an area, um, typically there's some kind of conflict, and this was no different. Um, in the summer of 1943, these massive migrations did lead to violence in some cities. Of these, the worst was Detroit. Um, and ultimately, federal troops had to be called in to end the violence. Um, on the West Coast, Mexican-Americans became the target of some off-duty sailors in what becomes known as the Zoot Suit Riots. And we talked about that a little bit in class. And, the, you know, it, it's called that because of the way, the fashion of the day for many of the Mexican-Americans um, dressed. And the irony of it was that police end up ar arresting the Zoot Suiters and not their attackers. Um, on a side note, um, a guy that they mention in the chapter, 
um, who was the governor of California at the time, is a guy named Earl Warren. And Earl Warren was a Republican. He was conservative, um, but he was also very sympathetic to the rule of law. And he was um, going to be sympathetic um, to the civil rights movement. Um, Earl Warren um, is going to become uh, the chief justice of the Supreme Court. He's going to be appointed by a conservative president. And he's going to make some, at the time, some of the most liberal uh, or hand down some of the most liberal opinions um, in, in history. Um, including the Brown versus Board of Education case that we'll get to. Um, the war, the home front, uh, also posed a real challenge to civil liberties. It says an immediate effect of the attack on Pearl Harbor was widespread fear in the United States that we could be, as a country, we could be attacked from within. Initially, when the war starts, the Japanese, Italian, and German aliens were subject to arrest or deportation. But by the winter of 1942, these federal orders had been lifted for all of the groups but the Japanese. We talk about that a little bit in class as well and, and why. Um, and it really kind of boils down to a couple of things. Um, racism is a part of it. Um, but because of the many on the West Coast who believed that the Japanese were just inherently disloyal, if you don't know what inherently means, it's basically you're, you're, you're born that way. It's not something that you can change. Um, FDR was pressured to deal with this, and he signs Executive Order 9066, which designated certain areas as war zones upon which anybody might, might be removed for any reason. And this is really just a, a way to um, round up Japanese, um, and these are Japanese migrants and Japanese American citizens that they could be removed and placed into internment camps. Um, and there you go. Both Japanese immigrants and native-born citizens of Japanese descent were forced into what they called at the time evacuation camps. And they were forced to sell their property at a loss and allowed to take only necessary items. And we talk about that, that many of them were given just a few days in, in order to sell off property, sell off businesses, and we talked about the fact, and I tried to use some of you as an example, that you know, what would you do if you had five days to sell your home or sell your business and you had to get rid of it? You didn't want to take a complete and total loss on it. And many of you got it right, and that was that you, you lower the price. Um, and as a result, you're, you know, you're talking about over 100,000 uh, Japanese um, and Japanese Americans that are going to be placed in these camps and, and the vast majority of them sell off their possessions. They were only to, able to take very limited things with them. Racism and lack of political clout help explain their harsher treatment than the other groups. And we also talked about what clout was in class. I hope you remember that. Japanese Americans, uh, as, the, as, as an interned group, or prisoner group, the vast majority would be placed in internment camps that were basically scattered throughout the um, the western half of the United States. Um, and you can imagine um, underfunded schools, food shortages, lack of proper medical care um, were were very common. And one of the guys, and and we're not going to talk about it too long because um, I'm known for talking too much, and I've also realized that I say the word ultimately too much. But um, Korematsu versus the United States. Um, Korematsu, um, basically, um, he's an American citizen. He is of Japanese descent. His first name is Fred. Um, he decided to sue uh, the United States. He re basically was arrested for refusing to cooperate and go into an internment camp. And he takes his case. It's appealed. It goes all the way to the Supreme Court. And at the time, the Supreme Court found in favor of the United States. They basically said, yeah, you know, normally you would have um, you would have an argument, but at, at, in a time of war, the rules um, change. Historically speaking, um, and even in, um, among legal experts today, they kind of look back on this as, as it being somewhat um, of a mistake. As a modern-day issue... Um, you know, Korematsu argued that, you know, nobody should be, you know, jailed or imprisoned because of the things that they believe or the country that they're from or the race that they are. And this kind of lends itself to the argument that revolves around um, racial profiling today. Anyway, I thought that was just, you know, something that you could dive into on your own. 
Also, the 442nd Regimental Combat Group of all Japanese soldiers, and this I don't think they're allowed to fight until around 1943, maybe the end of 1943, um, but they helped co combat the idea that Japanese Americans were not loyal. They served with um, great distinction in World War II. Also, um, this was something that we talked about quite a bit because we did a little lesson on propaganda, and a lot of the propaganda that we had in our country um, was um, promotional posters, promotional um, films, promotional you know little commercials that you might see at the movie theater that encouraged people to buy um, war bonds. Um, but because of the war, the national debt would skyrocket from 42 billion to 269 billion, and that's a big jump. So as a as a way to pay down this debt, um, they levied a five percent income tax, um, as well as like what I mentioned before, the major push to purchase um, war bonds. And if you don't remember what a war bond was, a war bond was essentially somebody, um, you know, you purchased a little piece of paper. It might be five dollars, ten dollars, fifty dollars, a hundred dollars, but it, that was. A, a, a cash loan that you made to the government to use initially or right then for the war effort and over time the government would pay you back with um, a nominal interest on it um, as far as supporting the war effort the government managed the economy um, one of the biggest things that FDR does as far as real um, you know, taking the federal government, the power of the federal government, and managing the economy was creating the Office of Price Administration. And this was done largely to keep inflation in check. Um, we also implemented um, rationing. And I told you that, you know, I can remember seeing um, my grandparents' ration books, particularly my mom's mom's ration books. Um, and this was really just done to ensure that people weren't wasting um, needed items that could be used for the war effort, largely fuel. Um, and obviously, you know, anytime you have something like that, anytime you introduce something new, especially when you're asking people to sacrifice, people are going to resist or resent it. But for the most part, you know, the general um, feeling in the country was that um, people just kind of accepted it as something that was necessary in order to win the war. And then lastly, um, and this was a big part of what we talked about the other day when we talked about propaganda. It's kind of a fun thing to talk about because um, there's so many great posters um, and artwork that comes out of it. Um, you know, I was talking, um, uh, the artist's name is not coming to my head, but... Um, a lot of these posters are even still today. The first one I showed you with Rosie the Riveter, you know, the vast majority of you guys recognize that one. And I think even still today, maybe the most recognizable piece of propaganda that we printed um, during, uh, or in, well, and I'm, I can't remember how far it dates back, but it dates back pretty far. But Uncle Sam, um, the recruiting poster. Um, but the Office of War Information, that's what they did. Um, they tried to um, create a relationship with um, national media groups, news, Hollywood, um, and it was all done to encourage support for the war effort. And it's a pretty big success. Um, and they're going to use, in some cases, Hollywood actors. If you think, um, I know many of you probably know who Jimmy Stewart was. Um, Jimmy Stewart was a really, really well-known actor. He became um, um, a pilot for the Army Air Corps, and uh, he was also a really well-known actor. And so he um, also made um, films, propaganda films, um, to encourage people to support the war. Okay, and um, lastly, before we get done, um, one of the other big things that they encouraged um, people to do um, was not to be wasteful. Um, the very last line in your section, you know, said that, um, instead of buying new, uh, many people followed the model, motto, use it up, wear it out, make it do, and do without. And I think uh, on some levels we could probably um, apply that advice to modern-day America. Okay, I'll load this up and send it off to YouTube. And again, you know, if you guys uh, think this is helpful, please let me know. Um, uh, I, I don't mind doing these things. I think it's actually kind of fun. Um, so, you know, you can leave a comment or just let me know in class. And uh, if it's something that you think helps, we'll just keep doing it. And I think maybe even uh, 
um, once we get towards spring break, we'll start making some EOI review videos for you so that you always have them at your fingertips.